All right, if you were here for the conference over the weekend, Friday and Saturday, then you know who our speaker is. For those of you who may not have been here, our speaker, teacher this morning, and the and he's going to preach in worship service as well, is Paul Taylor. He's from the Mount St. Helens Creation Center in Castle Rock, Washington. And he spent the last two days, Friday night and Saturday, equipping us in creation apologetics and uh, young earth worldview issues, etc. And so Paul is going to be here now to talk to you about presuppositional apologetics. So with that, please welcome Paul Taylor. Now, um, I must admit, I thought I was going to be speaking in a Sunday school room, so I planned this a little bit differently. I planned it to be a sort of seminar, okay? And as with um, most good Christian churches, half of you sat at the back. So this is now your opportunity to get up and come into the first few rows, please, because what I want to do, this is not going to be a lecture, okay? Or at least, well, it may be a lecture. It depends how quiet you are. Um, I will try and get you to respond, and I, um, if you want to ask questions during the, uh, the, during the uh, talk, then please do so. Don't wait for the end. If that means I don't get through all the material, it doesn't matter. I will have got some through some of the material, okay? So that was my plan. This is not meant to be a sermon. This is not meant to be a talk like yesterday. If you keep quiet, then it will become that, but we'll see. Okay, well, I wanted to talk to you a bit about apologetics. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you about apologetics is because I am concerned that a lot of people who refer to themselves as apologists are doing apologetics in a manner which is unbiblical. Most of the well-known apologists that you find are uh, doing apologetics in a manner that is unbiblical. And you know, right as soon as I say that, some of you might be saying, well, what are you talking about? What is apologetics anyway? You know, are we supposed to be saying sorry that we're Christians? Apologizing for being Christians. Well, when we're talking about apologetics, and I will define the terms so that you know what we're talking about, um, there are a number of passages of Scripture which are helpful to go to, but the most important one, probably the main one, is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And you may well be very familiar with this, or at least you may well think you're very familiar with this, but I would like you to turn to it anyway, please. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 13. Now, I have noticed that unlike yesterday's talks with uh, the, the um, few slides I've got here, I have noticed that I have forgotten to change the scripture version in the slides from the English Standard Version, which I normally use, to the New, en New American Standard Bible. I do apologize for that. Okay, I know um, that you think the New, en New American Standard Bible is the only re uh, received word of God. Okay. Um, <laughs> Please forgive me, so that's why we'll turn to this now and we'll read it from the New American Standard Bible so that you know exactly what's there and you can compare it and work out what, what we need to learn. So from verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation. And do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Let's stop there. Okay, so... I did say First Peter 3, didn't I? Or did I say Second Peter? I said First Peter. Okay, I got it right then. I was just worried then. I thought some people were not finding it easily. I thought maybe I said Second Peter by accident. Because I do often use Second Peter chapter 3 for other things. So that was First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 includes the word defense. I don't know what's happened to the picture there. Is there anything we can do about that at all? It looks perfect on my computer. Is there anything we can do at the back there at all to, to make that right? Okay. Uh, I'll try it again. Okay, that looks okay. 
that ah there we are that's better okay just have a look please at um, verse 15 verse 15 there is one particular clause there which um, apologists often quote always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. Just stick with that particular phrase for a minute. Always being ready to make a defense. Defense of what? What are they asking you to defend? What's Peter asking you to defend? The word? Okay, do you hear that? The word? The Bible? Anything else? Anyone else? The word? The Bible and your hope, your faith, what you believe, the Christian faith, which includes uh, the words of Scripture there. You're being asked to defend that, okay? Who are you being asked to defend it to? Who? Uh, unbelievers? Well, although it's got the word everyone, it qualifies it, doesn't it? So it doesn't mean everyone, everyone. It's everyone who asks you for the, about the hope that's within you. Everyone with whom you are having a conversation. Everyone who is asking you to defend your faith. What hope have you got? And you're being asked to defend your faith for that purpose. And, of course, there are other words there that ask you, you know, what means you're going to use. Now, if anyone is reading um, either uh, the King James Version or one or two other versions at this point, you'll know that it says there um, that we should always have an answer. An answer. So it could be the word defense or it could be the word answer. And both those are correct because they are both giving you um, the meaning of the Greek word. And the Greek word there is ap apologia. Apologia. I've written it in Greek there for those who recognize the letters. I, I, I said yesterday, for those who were here, I'm not an expert on Bible languages. I know a little Greek, not much, and I'm completely self-taught. I've never attended a seminary class on the subject, but I, I know a little bit. I know almost no Hebrew, but I try and get these things, A, from computer programs, and B, from people who I, who I respect, and I know that they know what they're talking about. Okay, so just bear that in mind, because if you're then going to butt in and ask me to translate a Greek phrase, because I've just happened to introduce a Greek word, I'm not going to be able to do it. So I'm not going to try and t pretend to you that I understand Greek. I, ha I can recognize those shapes, and I have got it from a program, and I know what they, they you know, I've, I've looked on all my references and so on to do it. Is that okay? Okay? So please don't start going away thinking, oh, that man this morning was a Greek expert. You know very well I am not, okay? Your pastor is, I am not, okay? <laughs> so ask him the difficult questions. Uh, ap apologia is the word that apparently is best translated as answer or defense. And it's from that that we get the word apologetics. And of course, you recognize it as the word, you know, where we get the word apology from. But you've got to understand that the use of the English word apology is not what it used to be. It's changed its meaning slightly. Nowadays, we think it, we, we use it to mean saying sorry. So, you know, those of you who are parents will tell your children, you must give an apology. You know, you hit your little sister, you better apologize. And what the little boy concerned says is, well, she did it first. And you say to that, the, that little boy, no, that's not a proper apology. You've got to apologize without an excuse. And of course, that's good parenting, but bad use of the English language. Because actually, in its literal meaning, what the little boy did was an apology. You see what I'm saying? Because of course, you, we wanted him to say sorry and wanted him to say sorry unconditionally. But the word apology used to mean a defense. And what he did was he defended himself. He gave you a reason 
He gave you an answer, a reason, a defense for why he had hit his sister. That doesn't mean to excuse it. It doesn't mean it was a good reason. <laughs> it's not an acceptable reason. Please don't think I'm undermining your parenting here. It's definitely not an acceptable reason, but it was a reason. Does that make sense? So on the older meaning of the word apology, that's what we would do. And you still see that, of course, in academic terms. Uh, you see a really good argument in a book, and you write an article uh, um, agreeing with that book, defending the things that were said in it. That article that you write is an apology for what has just been said. Does that make sense? You know, your favorite politician has said something that's controversial. Other people disagree with that person. They put all sorts of comments on Facebook about that, and you put a comment defending what your favorite politician has said. Your comment was an apology. You see? You were not saying sorry for what they said. You were defending what they said. And that is what apologetics means. And it is, therefore, a biblical thing that we should be doing. We should be, in that sense, apologizing for the faith. But we are definitely not saying sorry for the faith. Quite the opposite. This is, a, uh, um, this is something that we should be doing. This is, a, this is a proactive. But having said all that, there are then some misunderstandings about how we do that. Because these might be the sorts of questions that you might get. And these are really what we're thinking about in terms of apologetics. Okay, and uh, we might be asking things like, how do you know, or we might be asked things like, how do you know the Bible is true? How do you know that God is real? Okay, there are a number of different answers to this. Well, let me just see what, uh, what your answers are. Please do not give me a long lecture. We haven't time for that. Give me a very, very brief summary. How do you know that the Bible is true? What would you say if someone asks you that? If I put you on the spot. How do you know the Bible is true? And please, I don't understand that anything you say, well, you know that it's not going to be adequate as I know because people have written entire thick books on this subject as an answer to this. I'm not expecting you to know to do that. Okay? How do you know the Bible's true? <coughs> Historical evidence. That might be one. Is that what you think about when somebody is challenging you and saying, well, that's something in the Bible? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the changed heart. That's good. So we've had evidence, we've had a changed heart. Basically, your experience is what's happened. How do you know that God is real? Oh dear, complete silence. <laughs> I think it's not that you don't know the answer, it's that you're frightened that I'm going to criticize your answer. <laughs> okay, please don't think that I'm going to do that. Because the Bible says that God is real. I see. That's it. Right, and so that's starting from a, a very firm belief that what the Bible is telling you is true. Yeah, I like that. Sorry, how do you know he's not real? Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's an interesting response. Um, I know that there are many atheists who will tell you, you know, you, you, your burden of proof is on you. And you might say, well, the burden of proof is not on you. And in fact, I would say that, the, uh, that, that, that you're right, that the burden of proof is not on you, but we need to understand why, because many Christians think that the burden of proof is on them. And there are many books and even, even movies that have been in the movie theaters recently that assume that the burden of proof is on Christians and that they have to make the case for this or that or whatever. Actually, the Bible doesn't do that. Here are some of the sort of answers that people might give, which I will go to. But, but I want to first of all mention that uh, many people will quote 1 Peter 3.15 without really fully understanding the context. And the context is important. This is the bit that people usually quote. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. But having got that in front of you, you know that's not the full verse. There's something at the big, before it, there's something after it, which is, in your hearts honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The last bit, very, very important. We're not to be belligerent. We're supposed to be winsome in the way that we defend the faith. So we must do it with gentleness and respect. That's that, you know, should go without saying. Of course, it's not always the case. There are some Christians, and I am one of them, who can get very, very argumentative. 
is something I have to repent of very, very frequently, okay? It's, um, in this bit, crossing the line there. But we've also got to remember the first bit. This is important because when you are defending the faith, you should do so using an argument which honors Christ the Lord as holy. And that is a problem because there are people who defend the faith with great gentleness and respect, but I would argue that the way they do so is still not honoring Christ the Lord as holy. I'll, give you, I'll show you what I mean by that uh, as we go through. But it is very important that our ap apologetics honors Christ the Lord as holy. And it's my opinion uh, that there are many, many apologists out there who are using arguments which they do out of genuine belief that, you know, they, they honestly think they're doing the right thing. But actually, if you listen to their arguments, their arguments are not honoring Christ the Lord as holy. Okay, I would suggest then that there are four main classes of apologetics, four different ways of doing apologetics, four different ways of answering those questions that I gave you. How do you know the Bible's true? How do you know that God is real? There are, there's an experiential apologetics, there's evidential apologetics, there's classical apologetics, and there's presuppositional apologetics. I want to show you very, very fast in just a couple of minutes how those work and why I believe that only one of those is biblical and that the other three are not, okay? That's, uh, that's my aim in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, let's start with, every, uh, with experiential apologetics. Now, this is really a label that one or two of us have put on this because I don't know that many people deliberately set out to use experiential apologetics, but here's how it goes. Obviously, it's to do with your experience. In other words, you defend the faith according to your experience. So the question, remember, is how do you know that God is real? And experiential apologetics is often people's default setting. So that a typical answer to the question, how do you know that God is real, is, I was raised that way. I was raised that way. Have you heard that argument? Okay. You're all frightened now because pro uh, I'll be very careful how I ask this question. It's probable that may have some of you, including me, may have used that argument. Because I was raised in a church home. I now look back and I think I was not raised as a Christian, but I was raised in what my parents thought was a Christian home. Okay? And there are some good things about that, let's face it. I did go to Sunday school. I don't think it was an adequate Sunday school, but I did learn a lot of Bible stories. And uh, so I did have a fair amount of knowledge by the time in my mid to late teens that I actually became a Christian. So the, the background there was of use, and I'm not going to despise it. My parents did what they thought was right at the time. Uh, they've gone to be with the Lord now, and they have gone to be with the Lord, because subsequent to, um, I was the first person in my family to be saved, but not the last, and my parents were both saved uh, later. So um, I was raised that way. But I hear this as a genuine answer. I was raised that way. Okay, do you think... This is where I'll answer, ask que a careful questions so that I'm not going to put you on the spot, okay? Do you think that is a satisfactory answer? Okay, think about it. Is it a persuasive answer? No. What about, you know, being from Britain, there are many parts of Britain where you might meet people who've um, uh, immigrated to Britain from different parts of the world, especially people from different parts of uh, the uh, British Commonwealth. So, for example, uh, when I was in Leicester, you would have had a lot of people who came from the Indian subcontinent. People brought up in Pakistan as Muslims. If you ask them, why do you believe in Allah? They might say, because I was raised that way. What about... Um, um, you know, my friends there who were Hindus. Why do you go into the temple and put a saucer of milk at the uh, foot of the statue? 
the elephant, the, the elephant god statue, I call his name, I've just forgotten momentarily. Why do you do that? Because I was raised that way. Now, it's not true then. If you were, if you were brought up in India, think of this question. If you were brought up in India, where there were a lot of Hindu people, and your parents were Hindu, would you now be a Hindu? It's a tricky question. Good. Well done. What a good, because God's sovereign, remember. What's God got to say about this? And here's the problem with the experiential apologetics. It's not recognizing God as sovereign. It's not recognizing Christ as Lord. And yet, many people, many Christians would say, oh yes, if I was brought up in India, I would be a Hindu. To which I might reply, well, are you a Christian only because you were brought up in America? Is it cultural? And again, without putting anyone on the spot, do you believe that there are cultural Christians who are Christians because they were raised that way? Yes. Quote Christians, yes. So the experiential apologetics, and as I say, you wouldn't then normally get a book with the title experiential apologetics. I'm saying it's just the default option. It's when people haven't really thought about it. But if you're, if you're on the spot and you're defending your faith, that may be the way that people say it. And we just say it's not a satisfactory answer. Nor is it a satisfactory answer to say, well, I'm a Christian because it works for me. Why is that not a satisfactory answer? It works for me. A lot of people like that answer, you know, today. Why do they like it? You know, why, why is that not a satisfactory answer? But why do they like it? You can answer either of those questions. It's a real question. Come on. It's not, it's not offensive. That's true. Though we don't necessarily, I understand, um, we have to be offensive in the sense of taking the battle out there, but not offensive in the sense of putting people's backs up deliberately. Hmm. Yes. Why is it popular today? It is. Everybody has their own thing. And remember, we're in a postmodern world. If you understand the times that we live in, this, of course, is the prevailing view. It's okay for you to be a Christian. That's your truth. I've got my truth. That's postmodernism, isn't it? The idea that everyone has their own truth. Now, that, of course, is unbiblical because actually truth means nothing if there is no standard behind it. There has to be a standard. Something is true because it's true. And why is it true? Because it's according to what God says. That's what makes it true. There is only one objective pattern of truth. And I should be pointing to a paper Bible here, but I've got a program on my... <laughs> the Bible is there. I can see the Bible there on my tablet. You can't see that, but that's why it's true, because it's in Scripture. Okay, second type of... Um, Apologetics is evidential apologetics. And this is where we get a little bit more problematic, where some of you may wonder what, I, what case I'm trying to make here. What's the evidence that will prove things to be true? What's the evidence? So you say, uh, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? What you might want to do then is give people evidence that God exists. Or why do you believe the Bible's true? Give them evidence that shows that the Bible is true. Okay? And I'm about to criticize this, so I'm letting you in on that, just for, again, so that you don't have too much fear on this. Why would I want to do that? Give people evidence that will prove things to be true. Isn't that a good method of doing it? Because this is, in fact, a method that many, many apologists today use in order to defend the Christian faith. God is real because I can give you the proof that he's real. I can make the case that he's real. Why would someone like me want to try and criticize that? And the answer very much here, just as a clue, is in the scripture passage that we actually read. Any ideas? Okay. Let me give you a scenario, and then maybe this will get you the answer. And I'm not letting you off the question, because I'm going to ask it again. But here's the scenario. Supposing you do this. Supposing you have some real winning 
arguments and your very eloquence in what you say. And you're speaking to the atheist here, and you're explaining some of the reasons why you believe that God is real. You give them those arguments, and at the end they say, yes, I can see then that there must be a God. Are you going to jump up and down at that point and say, praise the Lord, because they've said that they understand and, and accept that there is a God? The demons know that. The demons know that there's a God. Actually, the demons know a little bit more than that, but many humans only know that there is a God. If you use... Yes, sir? It fa that is true. Did you hear that? It's an application of the wisdom of men. And therefore, it fails to sanctify Christ. How can it fail to sanctify Christ? Well, here's the, here's the reason why it can fail to sanctify Christ. You've got them to believe in a God. What God? What God? What God? You know, as a creation speaker, it applies in creationism because there are a lot of people who say we should be showing people um, we don't need to mention God. We can get people in schools, in, in uh, public schools, to learn intelligent design. That, uh, you know, instead of believing that uh, organisms evolved, we can show them that there are mechanisms which are so complex, they could not possibly have evolved. They must have been designed intelligently. So there is an intelligence that designed them. And many creationists think that is a wonderful thing to do. And by the way I'm saying this, you obviously have gotten the idea that I don't think it's a wonderful thing to do. Can you see why? You brought them to believe in a God, a creator. What's the point? Because if they believe in a God, a creator, they are still going to hell. Just as much as the atheist who doesn't believe in a God, who actually really does believe in a God, believes himself to be God. Remember, the Bible says that there isn't actually any such thing as an atheist anyway. Okay? Knowing God, they refuse to accept him as God. Romans chapter 1. Read through that section. That's why Ray Comfort wrote a, a book called uh, God Does Not Believe in Atheists, <laughs> which is a brilliant title and absolutely biblically true, isn't it? God does not believe in atheists. He knows that there are no atheists because he knows that everyone knows that he exists, but many people refuse to accept him because they prefer their sin. That's what Romans 1 says. So here's where many godly people whose intentions are very good try and give you arguments to prove to you that God exists, and they bring you to believe a God. And if that God is only the end result of an argument then he's not the true God. He's not the God of the Bible. And it does you no, go no good at all. Now, there was a gentleman called Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew. Have you heard of him? He was a well-known atheist in Britain who wrote books and books and books on the subject of atheism. Uh, when the Humanist Manifesto number no. 3 was published, he was one of the signatories to that. He was a man who was quoted widely by other atheists who you will know of, such as Richard Dawkins and others, quoted him as being a well-known philosopher. He criticized the idea of life after death. He criticized the idea of the problem of evil. Evil and any form of meaningfulness. It was in 2003 that he signed the Humanist Manifesto, version 3. And the very next year, 2004, he changed his position, and he stated that he now believed in the existence of an intelligent creator of the universe. Atheists were horrified. Many, many Christians were jumping up and down for joy. Can I rain on the parade? I'm afraid I wasn't jumping up and down for joy. If any, any of you heard about Anthony Flew, I don't know whether you were or not. He did not become a Christian. He, believe, he turned his, uh, instead of being an atheist, he became what's known as a deist, where he believed there was something controlling the universe, but you couldn't really know who or what it was. 
How is that better than being an atheist? An atheist really inside the heart really knows that God exists, and a deist inside the heart really knows that God exists, and they actually know that the God that exists is not Allah or an elephant God or anything else, that the God that exists is actually the God of the Bible. But they refuse to accept that. So the Bible tells us. So we shouldn't have been jumping up and down for joy. Anthony Flew died a deist. We have no idea what he may or may not have done on his deathbed. But if he did nothing else on his deathbed, and, did, and he did no repentance and putting his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, then becoming a deist and acknowledging that being an atheist is wrong did not save him. Sorry if that depresses you, but it's true. It's the truth, what the Bible teaches. So giving people evidence to prove that there's a God also doesn't exist. Now, there are many apologists who will take uh, this a little bit further, and they'll say, well, after all, seeing is believing, isn't it? Well, seeing actually is not necessarily believing. Try this for size, for example. This is a place in Scotland called Electric Bray. Watch this car. See if I can get it to work. There's a short video clip here. It should be uh, moving. Whoops, my computer has uh, just disconnected from... Uh, That is not good. Okay, well, I'm going to move beyond that picture, and uh, it's a YouTube video. You can find it very easily. But this place called Electric Bray in Scotland, uh, you can uh, get out of the car, take your brakes off the car, and allow the car to roll backwards uphill. You can see that you're driving downhill, but you take your brake off the, uh, off the car, and the car rolls back uphill, not rolling downhill. Why? Because obviously it really is going downhill, but the lie of the land is an optical illusion. And uh, it's a well-known spot in, uh, in, uh, in Scotland. There's a town called Bray, but more recently they started calling it Electric Bray. Seeing is believing, and people say that, but actually your eyes are one of the, uh, your, your seeing sense is the sense that is actually the easiest to fool believe it or not. Your eyes are very easy to fool. Well, my computer's saying it's connected, but it's not showing connected on the screen. Do we, um, do we know why? Uh, is there a, uh, do we know why it's not connecting at all? I'm going to try again. Okay, magic is about to happen. There we go. All right, let's try again. That's spirit. That was uh, that's a picture of Spirit Lake. Not the Spirit Lake here. The Spirit Lake near Mount St Helens. Well, we're still not getting what I want here. It's still not uh, producing the right effect. Okay, well, I'm going to have to do this without slides and just straight from the notes because we can't see the picture, and I hope you'll just excuse me doing that. But seeing is not believing. Seeing doesn't, uh, doesn't work that way. If you remember, the idea of seeing is believing is something that was mentioned in Scripture because the Apostle Thomas mentioned it. And he said, you know, I'm not going to believe that Jesus has risen until I see the, uh, the nail prints in his hands and, the hole, and his feet and the hole in his side. And Jesus, very graciously, when he next appeared and Thomas was in the room, invited Thomas to prove for himself. It's interesting, by the way, that Jesus only ever offered evidence to people who were already believers. Read through and you'll see that. If there was somebody who wasn't a believer, like, for example, uh, Jairus, when Jesus wanted, uh, was going to heal Jairus' daughter, the evidence that, G that Jesus gave him was only believe. Only believe. Which is why when I wrote a book, on the subject of apologetics, I entitled it Only Believe. Because Jesus, throughout uh, the Gospels, you'll find this, he never offers evidence to unbelievers. He only offers evidence to believers. And that's a key point. Evidence is not for unbelievers. Evidence is for believers. It backs up what you believe, and it causes you to praise God. Evidence given to unbelievers does not cause them to praise God, and therefore does not sanctify God as holy. Does not sanctify Christ the Lord as holy. 
Classical apologetics is what uh, many Christians want to go into. This is the third type, and it's evidential plus. You'll use evidential apologetics with all the problems that I've just made, and you'll try to prove to somebody that a God exists. And then you'll add a bit to that to say, well, the God that exists has to be the God of the Bible. Let's have a look at things like fulfilled prophecy. And this is very popular, and in some ways it might be a slightly better system. But it still is not uh, immediately sanctifying the Lord as holy, because even there, the prophetic words are there for the believers, a sign for believers to help them understand that what Scripture is doing is pointing us to Jesus Christ. So even then, it's not really giving you much more than the evidential apologetics did. And after all, the bulk of your argument is the evidential method anyway, trying to give them evidence to prove to them that God exists. So I would say, therefore, that although the classical apologetics looks a little bit better, that is also really not what uh, Scripture requires. So that brings us back to, um, uh, to our passage. And just, re just a reminder, by the way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Evidence is things that are seen. And you're trying to give to people to try and prove to them that God exists. You're trying to give to them things that are transient. But it's the things that are unseen that are eternal. And that's what Romans 1 is talking about, the things that are unseen. They're the things that they already know. Because as I said, all, everybody already knows that God exists. But they're refusing to accept that because uh, uh, they prefer their sin. So that brings us then to the, um, the fact that many people would say evidence speaks for itself. Have you heard people say that? Evidence speaks for itself. Actually, that's not true. Evidence doesn't speak for itself. Evidence is interpreted. So, you know, if I could have got that video working for you, you could have seen the car rolling up the hill, a gentle slope uphill. And you would have said, well, that proves that there's a different sort of gravity in Scotland because the evidence speaks for itself. But, of course, then you look a little bit further and you see, actually, there is a different interpretation of the evidence that relies on the fact that the way that the rocks are arranged and even the direction that the trees are growing has fooled your eyes. So that really what appears to be uphill is actually downhill. The evidence should have been that if the car is rolling in one direction, that must be downhill. That should have been the evidence. But of course our eyes have fooled that. So evidence is not, um, evidence does not speak for itself. Evidence is interpreted. That's why in what I normally do when I'm talking about things, giving people evidence, and I will give people evidence, but in a different context, evidence itself proves nothing. If I show you how complex a cell is, an evolutionist will say, look at how well that has evolved. And a creationist will say, look how well God has designed that. The same evidence with different conclusions. One of those conclusions is correct. In all cases, if you think about it, if someone gives you the evidence, they will interpret it. If you've got two different interpretations, they could both be wrong, but they can't both be right. They can't, because you can't have truth for you and truth for you and truth for you. There's only one truth. But although they can't all be right, although they uh, can't all be right, although they could all be wrong, one of them could be right. And of course, it's the one that lines up with Scripture that's right. And that brings us to presuppositional apologetics. A presupposition is not necessarily correct, of course. You could have a false presupposition. So when I talk about presuppositional apologetics, I have to tell you what presuppositions we actually need, which is why we need to go back to the Scripture on this. But here's an example of um, a presuppositional question, and it's a famous one. You must have heard this question being asked many times. Supposing I picked on someone at random, one of the gentlemen in the audience, and I said, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You've heard that question, haven't you? Think about it. If you've heard the question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? How should that man respond? Should he say yes or no? 
Exactly. Instead of answering the question, you've got to challenge the presuppositions because the question has a presupposition that you were beating your wife at one time. Now you've stopped or now you haven't stopped. The question is not a fair question. And the majority of questions that are being asked are not fair questions. And actually, the questions that I asked you at the beginning were not fair questions unless you answer them presuppositionally. You know, the question to say, how do you know God is real, is equivalent to saying, how do you know that your wife is real? You know, I go to places often when I'm speaking. I'm very privileged here because my wife's here on, uh, on this row. Many times I would have to say, well, my wife's not there. Right? She's not with me. She's at home. How do you know, therefore, that I'm married? How do you know that my wife exists? I've shown you a photograph on the screen. But people can use Photoshop, can't they? There are even such things as deep fakes these days where uh, people are very, very realistic-looking people can be invented and even made to move. You can even uh, mix up CGI animations with real, um, with real movies. It's a strange world we live in. How do you know? Well, the point is, so that to prove to you that my wife exists, I'm not going to give you very much evidence at all, am I? I'm going to introduce you to her. That's the way we do it. And I'm going to introduce you to God. I know that God exists. It's not a question of proof. I know God exists like I know my wife exists. He's real. He's real. And what's more, I know God is real in exactly the same way that everyone else knows God is real. If there's an atheist sat here and he says to me, how do you know God is real? I will say exactly the same way that you do. You see? You're challenging the presupposition. The presupposition is that God might not be real. The true presupposition is that, of course, God is real because we know him. Everybody knows him. So there's your answer. I know God is real in exactly the same way as you do. And I'm not going to waste time giving evidence to prove that. Because everybody knows God is real. And you're challenging their assumptions straight away. You're challenging their presuppositions. My second son, Jack, once came running in. I think he was, uh, must have been about, let's see, maybe about 11 years old. Came running downstairs and uh, came into the kitchen where I was, sat, where I was uh, trying to arrange a meal. And his question was, Dad, have you got any of that stuff for filling in holes in a wall? What should have been my answer? Should I have said, no, I'll go out and buy some? Should I have said, yes, because actually that would have been the truth for answer. I did have some of that stuff. He must have seen it at some point. Um, Polyfiller was uh, the brand name that we had in, uh, in Britain for filling in the sheet, what, uh, the sheet rock, holes in the sheet rock in the wall. That isn't the answer I gave. Well, as some of your parents, if, you're, if your son came to you and said, Dad, have you got any of that stuff for filling in holes in walls, what would your answer have been? What have you done? <laughs> he had made a hole in the wall, <laughs> and he wanted to cover it up without letting me know, but he wanted to see if he could find some of that stuff for filling in holes in the wall. There was a presupposition behind the question. There is always a presupposition. Okay, and let's uh, look back at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, then, in conclusion. 1 Peter chapter 3, um, in fact, just going before 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we read from verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what's good? Because the, f the verse 15 has got the Greek word apologia in for a defense or argument, many people think, therefore, we should use Greek argumentation. But that's not true. And here's why, and this is where I'll end. Will you please turn to Isaiah chapter 8? Isaiah chapter 8. And in fact, if I can find this right, I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12. Here is what it says. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or in be in dread of it. It's the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. He shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary 
but to both houses of Israel a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. Does that sound familiar to you? It should do, because it's very, very similar to, uh, in an Old Testament version to what's just been said in 1 Peter chapter 3. And I did have a slide that put the two together and compared them, and I'm going to leave this as your work. Go back and compare these two passages. It's very similar. In other words, the arguments that we should use should not go to any form of Greek argumentation of giving people evidence of trying to prove by uh, logical deduction that God exists. No, they should presuppose that God exists and that the Bible is true and you go back and you show them from Scripture what they need to know. Because that's what Peter was doing. Peter might have been writing in Greek but he didn't think in Greek and that's why it's so precious probably that it was Peter who wrote this rather than Paul. Of course, it would have been equally true if Paul had written it, if God had inspired him to write it. It's all inspired. But I'm just saying, here's someone we know who would think in Hebrew, you think in the, in, the, um, uh, in the Jewish way of doing things. And so his first response here is not Greek. Of course, Paul would have done as well, but Paul knew uh, Greek philosophy. Peter wasn't, wasn't versed in Greek philosophy, so he is immediately taking you not to Greek philosophy, but straight back to the Old Testament scriptures. It's the whole of scripture today, of course, but that's what we use. That is to be our presupposition, that God is real and that the Bible is true. And that's where we start from. That's what presuppositional apologetics is about. And everything else you might study on the subject will be just fleshing that out and putting it into practice. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it's true. And I thank you, Lord, that it speaks of you in every word and every page. I pray, Lord God, that we will sanctify Christ the Lord as holy in the way that we speak to people and the way that we defend our faith and the way that we point people to you for the honor and for the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you.